Ephesians chapter 5, and in verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. If I was to focus in on one particular verse in that chapter, it would probably be verse 16 there. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Here the charge is to redeem the time. If you were to look back at the beginning of that chapter, you find he says, Be followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So Christ gave of himself. And this was a pattern, the, the Bible says, that Christ was the pattern that we should follow after him as his example is given. Verse 3, then, is the contrary part, and it says, Fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as becometh saints. So in act here, or even in association, these items, these, these, these sins are unbecoming of the Christian. Fornication, of course, we cast out. Uncleanness, just, just general uh, filthiness of the mind and of the spirit and of the motives. Covetousness, desiring what is not yours. These are grievous sins, and they're not something that should be named among Christians. It's unbecoming of Christian to be in act or in association with these sins. Verse 4 says, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. 
These things are not convenient. They are inconvenient. In other words, they're not suitable, fitting, or proper in this place or in this context. They are, they are inconvenient. Filthiness, foolish talking, nor jesting. And, and both of these groups of sins constitute what would be something unbecoming of Christians as well as something that is just inconvenient. It's not a proper uh, to be associated with the believer. But rather, giving of thanks are to be the motives in the heart of the Christian at this time. So the unbecoming acts and the inconvenient acts are something that if we would look at our lives, we would perhaps find these things. I know sometimes myself, foolish talking or jesting, especially in the workplace, it's easy to get drawn into those types of things. And these things are inconvenient to the Christian. They're not suitable to the Christian. But these are also things that we don't just encounter at the workplace. We also encounter in, in social media venues, in, in, uh, in going about in this world and running into these things. These are issues that are always happening in the believer's life. But we are to be contrary to these. There's a higher call. There's higher importance to the believer. We have to partake of these things. Look at verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. That's the world out there at large that's disobedient to the gospel. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. The church is clear to the Christians. Follow God, verse 1. Don't be partakers with them, being the world at large in the context of what's being referred to. The wrath of God on the children of disobedience, the unbelieving world. Verse 8 says, For ye were sometimes darkness. Now most of us weren't saved, you know, as a young child. And so when you hear something, ye were sometimes darkness, that probably hits home. Myself being 25, I had all sorts of years of opportunity to be of darkness sometimes, right? But now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of the light. So ye were darkness, now you're light, do it. <laughs> be, be light, walk as the children of light. That's what's appropriate. Ye were this way, walk as light, walk as as God, follow God, follow Christ, walk in love as he hath walked in the same, and have no part nor act with or association with the unbecoming sins of the unbelieving world. So he says here, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and that's what our walk should be. It should be one where we show forth or prove or, or signify what is acceptable unto God? That should be basically our testimony each and every day. It's just a walk of things that God would find acceptable and appropriate. That's our higher call. That's the higher importance. That's, that's the higher priority that we ought to have. Verse 14 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And this is something that Christians need to grab a hold of, is the will of God. What is his will for today? What is his will for my life? What is his will in, in each and every decision that I make? And how do we find that? We need to have the light of Christ, it says in verse 14. And we need to be walking circumspectly, not as fools. What's circumspectly? Spectly, it's like spectacles, like my glasses. You're looking. Circum, that's a circle. So you're just always looking around, always using your eyes to discern the situation that you're in and to react appropriately to these. There's a higher call, of higher importance. And we need to have our priorities straight in this life and in this walk. Verse 16 brings it all to, to urgency, to, to an imminency. We need to redeem the time because the days are evil. In other words, we've lost a lot of time when we were of darkness, and now we are of light. Redeem that time. Take advantage of the time that you have now. Bring it back into yourself and use it. Understand what God's will is and do it and perform those things. The days are evil. The time is short for you to please God and to do those things that are well-pleasing in his sight. And how do we do that? Be filled with the Spirit. The Bible says here, be drunk. Be not drunk with wine, whereas in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And that comes from having, having a walk where you're speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Being Spirit-filled is something that we need to try and, 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 and seek to accomplish. We need to purposefully get filled with the Spirit each and every day, putting away the things of the former life, putting away the flesh, and 
actually getting after spiritual things. Psalms every morning. Hymns every morning. Spiritual songs. Just having those songs of spiritual things and spiritual matters, that melody just flowing through your life. That needs to be how our walk is each and every moment of each and every day. We need to redeem the times when it comes to those things. If you could, go to Psalm chapter 90. Psalm chapter 90. And as I turn to Psalm chapter 90, let's remember the words of the Lord Jesus, a 12-year-old Jesus Christ on this earth. He said, Wist ye not that I must be about my Father's business? His focus was clear. His, his, his walking in the light was clear. Even from a young child, he was prepared and ready after these things. Even so, even to the point of leaving his parents behind as he went to minister in the temple. Was he not that I must be about my father's business? Was he not that each and every one of us ought to be about our father's business? If you were to look in Psalm 90, and in verse 9, the Bible says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. And any one of us who, who are grown now can look back at our past, and maybe when we were kids it was like, man, I can't wait to be an adult, and now it's just the years are just flying away, just moment by moment by moment. I look at my son, he's three and a half years old, going on four. It's unbelievable how this time has flown. People send me updates on Facebook. Hey, remember when we met two years ago? And I'm like, whoa, it seemed like it was yesterday. The Bible says our life is as a tale that is told. It, it is just flying by. It's soon cut off and we fly away. Verse 11 says, Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. And here's an important point. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. We need to understand that our days are numbered. God, God knows the acceptable time. God knows the reasonable time and when we're going to pass away. Outside of time, God sees the end from the beginning. It's no, it's no marvel to him. And we tell people soul winning all the time that you can step out of this building and your life would be over. We need to have that same consideration in our own lives. We could step outside this building and our life could be over. We need to recognize this. We need to ask God in this way. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We need to redeem the time because the days are evil. What does that mean? They're harmful. Every day that goes by is another day that's bringing you close to that end. Your last shot, your last opportunity to preach the gospel to someone. Your last opportunity to perform good works into your Father. Your last opportunity to, to breathe some life back in this nation that we live in. And these days are passing. These days are numbered. These days are, 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 are fleeing us. Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. Even from age 12, he had that focus. Let's get that back in our lives. Let's get the focus in. Let's, let's set our priorities. Let's recognize that the, the duties that we have before God are of the utmost importance. Go to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. We're going to get a little practical here in a moment. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. The Bible in Philippians chapter 4. It says in verse 7, the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay, We need to have that peace of God where our mind is straight, where our mind is focused, where our mind is kept by the Lord. Verse 8 says this, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. In the context of redeeming the time, in the context of being about our Father's business, with numbered days that are soon to end. Each and every day when we wake up, are we focusing our hearts and minds as God intends on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, of any virtue, of any praise. I'm going to pick on some things in particular here. These days there is a, a pandemic. There is, there is just the overflow and abundant problem that many of us had, and that's one of distraction. 
myself included, too often social media outlets, too often the Facebook, too often the YouTube are consuming my attention. And I mean, it only has to be 20 minutes before you've taken 20 minutes that should have been God's and you should recognize that if the days are evil, our time is short, could not those 20 minutes have been better spent? Too often we're, we're, just, we're just flipping away our days, just looking at the latest feed, looking at the latest news, looking at the latest thing coming down the pipeline in our social media outlets, in the, in the YouTube outlet, in the Facebook outlet. There are things there that are redeemable that, that you can take and you can grow thereby. But by and large, it is not what you find in Philippians 4.8, is it? I mean, if we could just open right now our latest Facebook feed, we could, we could see. If we could open up the YouTube uh, main page, could you see things that are true? Things that are honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, with praise unto God? I think not. And today the problem of wasted time transcends the social media waste. But today we have... And I just did a few little bit of uh, searches on this thing because I'm so far out of the game, if you would. But today we have people wasting their lives and wasting their time, young and old alike, on video games. We, we find so often and so many, and the stats are just un, unheard of. The, the top games right now are, are Crossfire, a Dungeon Fighter. And then just to think that we're, 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 these are just things for guys and things that the, the, the boys get behind, Pac-Man and, and Candy Crush are at the top list. Right now, Crossfire, which is a first-person shooter, has, has features like a zombie deathmatch, whatever that is. But there are 660 people worldwide taking part in this game to the tune of $10.8 billion in revenue. And that's just one of the games, and that one's more popular in, in, uh, in Asian countries. Here we have the same, uh, same gameplay likeness in the Call of Duty um, arm of things. In the Call of Duty, I and mean, there's like 15 different versions of this thing. And these games are games where you go around and violently shoot and massacre one another over and over and over. And I think the zombie mode is where the guy will just regenerate and he gets to go at it again. So you get to shoot this guy two, three, four, five, six times. You get to play out the filthiness, the unrighteousness, the wickedness over and over and over and over and over again. Dungeon Fighters, same. It's like our Double Dragon of old, if you remember. It's, it's these fighting games where there's violence, where there's nudity, where there's dismemberment, where there's, where there's wickedness being placed before you to the tune of, of entertainment, to the purpose of entertainment. And it's not entertaining. It may be for a moment, but what is the cost of these things in the, in the scheme of eternity? God says true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, things of virtue and praise are what we're to be thinking about. And too often our minds are being drawn into things that are the complete opposite of these. Even your Pac-Man and your Candy Crush. What time is wasted? That game you have it running up to 11.8 billion dollars, 600 million people playing this thing. At one point that game, Candy Crush, was making one million dollars a day in revenues. And that went on for a long time. Just cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. And these are games that often start out with a free pass. You get in, you get to play a little bit of it, you get addicted, and next thing you know, they're asking you to, asking you to level it up. Pay a little bit more to keep playing. Pay a little bit more. A million dollars a day. Can you imagine somebody making a program like that? And then just letting it loose and just sitting back and collecting millions and millions and millions of dollars. It's, it's because people are ignorant and people are unwise. We're to redeem the time because the days are evil. God says walk circumspectly, not as fools. Be looking around. And what are we when we are in our, our, our devices like this? We're not looking around. We're not being focused on the things of God. We're not appropriating our hearts and our minds and ourselves into the things of God. We're not, we're not bringing the peace of God into our lives, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. No, we're focused on something that's not even real and will not matter in eternity to come. 
We've got to think about some of these things, myself included. As I, as I get into, into Facebook to hear the latest news, as I'm, as I'm watching YouTube, and it could be just something silly, right, just, just to a occupy my mind for a time, I've got to be asking myself certain questions. Is this something that is true, honest, just? And all of these things mentioned that bring the peace of God. How about turn a few pages to Colossians chapter 3 to the right. Colossians chapter 3. The Bible records in 1 Corinthians 10, do all to the glory of God. Now, now take a moment of time in your life and just ask yourself, is what I'm doing right now bringing glory to God? Because God expects us to do everything to his glory. And how often do we waste seconds and minutes and hours on things that do not glorify God whatsoever. They glorify the flesh. He says, do all to the glory of God. Colossians 3, in verse 23, it says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord and not unto men. Okay, so whatever you're doing, whatever you're engaging in, whatever you are choosing to spend your time, your, your limited time, your, your fleeting time on, whatsoever you do, do it heartily. That, that, that's with heart. That's with intent. That's with purpose. That's with a fullness. That's with a desire as unto the Lord and not unto men. We need to have focus in our, in our lives where everything we do, we're consciously and constantly thinking about God, bringing Him glory and giving Him the most of our heart. Verse 24 says, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Okay. That's great, because when I go and I play my Candy Crush, my reward is what? Digital shekels, right? When I go and I play my shoot 'em up game, what's my reward? Knock a guy down, he gets back up again, and my mind is defiled by these things, and my, my conscience is defiled by these things. And yet God says, if you do something heartily unto me, I have a reward that I will give to you. You serve me, and you're accumulating an inheritance that is incorruptible. So we're talking about things that are digital that don't even exist versus something that is spiritual that will exist for eternity. If you're making an investment, where would you choose rather to make your investment of your time? You should put it on things that will give you eternal consequence, eternal significance, eternal glory, eternal inheritance. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 101 verse 3 says... I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. And how often are we sitting there playing those games and just, just constant wickedness is before our eyes? How often are we, are we flipping through our social media and there's just constant wickedness before our eyes? How often are we, are we spending our time in things whereby we are constantly having wicked things placed before our mind. God says, I will set no wicked things before our minds. That was David. That was King David who, the Bible records, had a heart after God. His heart was fully set on pleasing the Lord, following after the Lord in all things. There is a man after mine own heart, the Lord says. And David says, I will set no wicked things before mine eyes. He didn't want to be distracted. He didn't want anything but what was listed in Philippians to be for him. He didn't want anything but what was true, what was honest, what was just, what was lovely, of good report. He wanted these things to be the constant meditation of his heart. Because he knew that was right. He knew that was what would bring him fruit in life eternal. In the life eternal. Go to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. Some points of wisdom here from Solomon. He messed up his life pretty bad, and I think a lot of times when he was writing the Proverbs, he was writing it from the, from the standpoint of, man, I wish I had done it right. I wish I had learned my lesson. I wish I had, had somebody writing Proverbs like these to me that I could learn and gain wisdom and walk as somebody that is wise before I had to learn failure myself and, and make the mistakes and, and bring my life to ruin in the latter days. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 15, it says, 
Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Slothfulness, when we're sitting there gaming, when we're sitting there just surfing the web, when we're sitting there just playing around on apps, just wasting time, we're cast into a deep sleep. And how often do you see that? Hey, hey, I'm talking to you. Hello, 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 hello. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Sorry, what'd you say? Because I was, I was focused on my, my game. I was focused on my app. I was, I was slothful. I was in that deep sleep. I was idle, and the Bible records that person shall suffer hunger. Why? Because you are not giving the proper energies, the proper focus upon the things that matter in this life and in the life to come when you're just constantly slothful, in that deep sleep, and idle in these things. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 27, it says, She looketh well to the ways of her household. She eateth not the bread of idleness. This is a, this is a, a great statement made of the virtuous woman. And we can adopt that too, man. We can understand that if we're looking well to the ways of our house, of, our, or of our, the expectation that we have to provide for it, if we look well to these things, men and women alike, and eateth not the bread of idleness, the Bible records great virtue is in these acts and in these behaviors. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband, all, husband also, and he praiseth her. The Bible says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And we ought to be one that fears God. And when we fear God, we give him the proper reverence. And when we give him the proper reverence, we give him that portion of our time, the set time, the number time that he has given to us, and we use it appropriately. A couple pages over in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and in verse 18. Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 18. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. What is that saying? You know, the virtuous woman looked well into her household and well into her matters and the things she had to take care of. Well, here... In contrast, the slothful one has a decaying building. And through the idleness of the hands, the house completely droppeth through. In other words, all of your foundation, all of your livelihood, everything that you have is at risk of falling through if you're a slothful person. If you're constantly idle in your life, if you're constantly having your hands busy on your device or busy in your game whatsoever it is that is keeping you from the proper things. The Bible says your house will drop through. Young men ought to take, take heed to these things. Be fearful. You realize there's 30, 40, 50 somethings who are completely absorbed in this garbage and they have houses that are fallen through. You have, you have people that have given their whole lives to being idle and being wasteful and just having their minds completely satiated with the wrong things. And they're useless people, by and large. They do not contribute. They do not raise godly families. They do not do the proper things. They are waste. They are wretches in this life. God wants something better for you today. If you would, go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 16. What a group to be likened unto in Ezekiel chapter 16. In verse 49. Ezekiel 16 and verse 49. The Lord here is talking about the great judgments that were coming upon different nations. And in verse 49 of Ezekiel chapter 16, he says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Okay, so Sodom being, being that type of that wicked nation, the one that we can all just, you know, shine and say, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. Well, the Bible likens Sodom to being Jerusalem's sister. And he says, here was the fall of Sodom, and we all think, oh, okay, well, for, of course it was the Sodom. Well, no. That was the end result of it. But what was their iniquity? Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty, and they committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. God saw it good to destroy some. God saw it good and needful to destroy them. And their sin was first pride puffed up, haughty, thinking more highly of themselves than they ought. The next was that they were full of bread. And here, as a nation, for the most part, compared to the rest of the world, especially when we have parents that take care of us, pay the bills, do all those things, we have the tendency to be full of bread. 
That leads to the abundance of idleness when you don't have to go out and work like some nations do. I mean, a lot of nations, a lot of places in this world, once, once you're about Mark's age, you're already going into town and you're doing work because the household can't be kept under the power of dad alone. And so you might be going down and tending to the flocks. You might be going down and gathering water. You might be going down and doing all those things. But those things are honestly good for a young man. Those things are appropriate for a young man. But here, we are a proud and full nation, and it's caused abundance of idleness, and it leads to wickedness. It leads to self-righteousness. It leads to being haughty and thinking you're above everybody. It ultimately leads to the abomination that Sodom had felt. Why? Because a, 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 a mind and a heart that is not focused on right things, good things that bring the peace of God will be distracted by the flesh and will be drawn unto sin. The Bible says that we all have our own lust. Sin, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth death. Well, where does that come from? When we are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. Do you know what you should do with your lust? Just, just beat them down. You know what? The best days in my life, spiritually speaking, are when I have just worked and toiled and done the best job that I can. And when I get home, I have no time to be idle because the second I'm idle, I'm sleeping. And that's how we ought to live our life, especially as young men and as, as older men. We need to work hard. We need to labor so that when we get home, even if we were to try to do something wick, wicked, like sit down and play Call of Duty, we'd be as soon as we turn the stupid thing on, right? Because we've worked hard, we've done what was right, we've done the appropriate thing. If you're able to sit there and game for hours and hours and hours, I wager you're not working hard enough. Right. Yeah. Amen. There's iniquity, pride, fullness of bread leading to the abundance of idleness. And this is the problem that we have. So many nations of the world, there's no way that young kids have enough time to sit around and play games. Okay? If they're playing, it's because they got a little bit of a break, and now they're playing with like a stick and a post. You know, they're just they're just running around chasing sticks. You know, playing with simple things like kids used to. But now the distractions are so many, and the idleness is so abundant. Our nation's falling into this trap, and you know where we're headed? The same direction that Sodom did. This is, a, this is a warning. A lot of us just want to go, oh, Sodom, you know, as long as we're not just, just homos, we'll be fine. No, Sodom had a pattern, and their pattern started with them being proud. Their pattern started with them being full of bread, abundantly idle, doing nothing with their lives. They became haughty, and abomination is what flowed in and filled them afterwards. Why? Because they weren't distracting themselves with godly things. They were leaving their time idle to let rotten and wicked things come into their lives. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, you can go actually to uh, Philippians chapter 2. I'm just going to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. It says, When I was a child... I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. And that all makes sense. Of course, right? Kids think like kids, talk like kids, they understand like kids. There's nothing wrong with that. Little children have, have crazy ideas, right? Little children mess around. They, 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 are, they are given grace because they're growing. But when I became a man, I put away childish things, okay? So, when I was a kid, I played video games. I spent my days playing with Legos. I spent my days doing, doing silly things, right? But there comes a point when you become a man and you put away those things. You quit wasting your time on games, wasting your time on media, wasting your time on things that do not profit you in the long run. And that's what I need to be more focused on. I think there's a few in here that need to be more focused on godly things and appropriate things, not childish things. Be a man! Put them away. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now so much more in my absence. And this is great because the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, you guys have always obeyed. You know, you, know, you know how I think he knew that? It was because he had a church here that, that was growing in the things of God. Read Philippians. It's all about taking those next steps, being challenged to a higher level of Christianity, one that's focused on God, one that's, one that's filled with the Spirit. He says, I know, basically... 
That even in my absence, you guys are living the godly life. You guys are doing the right things. I know this. He says, but now also much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So he knows they're obeying. He knows they're doing the right things. He knows, but, but I think he's, he's understanding that the challenge needs to still be put out, that there is more work to be done. Work out your own. That means it's your personal salvation. If you're saved today, it's just talking to you. You've got to work it out with fear and trembling. You're saved, you're born again. Take what you've learned and work it. Work out your own salvation. Work out what God has worked in is what I like to hear. God put a new man in you that has zero sin. I should see that, right? You should work that out. That's what the challenge is made here. God put a brand new man in you. He has worked that thing in there. It's completely his work. You're going to heaven. But what good is it, James chapter 2 says, to your brethren if you're not working that thing out? If you're not showing forth the new man that is in you? If you're not demonstrating the godly Christian life? It's of no use. It's of no value. And you will have no promise of an inheritance greater than salvation when you arrive in heaven. And I don't know about you, but I want something even greater than salvation. That's like the first step. God just gives you this gift. Wonderful, but now you can earn stuff even greater than that. Can you imagine how great the gifts and rewards will be from a father that loves us so much that he gave them all up to come to this world and get us? Wow. But we got to work out that salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So that should be our desire is to basically just let God finish the work that he started. And he will. He will make a full end and we will stand incorruptible before him. But I think also God would like to work in you his own will, his own pleasures, that you can do those things now. It wouldn't just be the scenario where you do nothing and you're useless in the kingdom of God. You're idle because you're sitting around playing video games all day. You're being a toddler. You're being a busybody. You're checking the Facebook. You're checking the internet. You're doing all these things that have nothing of significant and lasting consequence and he just takes you home and now he works in you, your perfect being. But God wants us to be sanctified now. He wants us to grow in grace now and in the knowledge of our Savior. He, he works these things in that we would perform them. He says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. And what's the goal? That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, all good things, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. What's God's desire here for you is that you would be blameless before him. Not, not, not just always idle, not just always, always finding distractions, not looking at wicked things all the time, not taking part in wicked things all the time. He wants you to be blameless and harmless as a son of God. As he sent his own son to be the savior of the world, and he walked an example that we should fall after, of course we can never be sinless like Christ. But we need to strive after the way Christ walked. We need to live after the way Christ walked without rebuke in the midst of, and this is the problem, we are to be blameless and harmless in the midst of the perverse nation. But how often do we just become that crooked and perverse nation? We put off being blameless. We put off being harmless. And we just take part of everything single wicked thing that they're going to put before us. So that this teenager looks no different than that teenager, though the one is a blood-bought child of the king. That's not right. We are to be a light in this world. We're to shine forth, be different in this world. And if we're sitting behind a screen, if we're wasting our time, we are not growing and we're not doing what God expects. What does he expect? Hold forth the word of life. Hold forth the word of life so that I can rejoice in the day of Christ and not just have that day catch me off guard. Where Christ shows up and I'm just like, well, he's here and I've done nothing for him. I don't want to be taken in that way. I want to shine as a light. I want to do right and run this race with a purpose. Because if we're just going through the motions here, if we're just going to waste the life that God gave us, then we will stand on the other side having run in vain. It was all useless. It was all pointless. It was all a waste. And nobody, nobody, nobody is going to want to stand before God having taken his eternal life 
Maybe he even explains to us all the things and all the purposes he had for us. Though I think we could probably remember opportunities that we've set by. Imagine all the things that you could have accomplished, but instead you were playing around on Facebook. Instead you were playing around on a video game. Instead you were playing around whatever, just wasting your life away. God gave you life for a purpose. If he had no purpose for you, do you know what he'd do? He'd just take us all home. We'd get saved and we'd disappear. God wants us to do great things for him. He's challenging us to do great things for him. He wants us to be different. He wants to be separate from the world. We want to redeem that time that we have wasted to date and spend the time that we have left doing something great for our Savior.